Shabbat Shalom. Uh, it's always a great privilege to come here and to share the Word of God with you. But before we start, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Jane Moscovich. He's the uh, North American Director of Jews for Jesus. Where is he? There he is. Well, be welcome here. And uh, Carl also is here for Jews for Jesus, uh, Regional uh, Director, I guess, here in Montreal. Good. Be welcome. So if you have your scriptures with you, you can open up to Luke chapter 1. You know, we're coming close to read the accounts of the birth of the Messiah in Luke 2. It took much time and it took many years. It took many thousands of years since it was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. But have you ever wondered why it took so long? Why didn't Eve give birth to the Messiah as she thought she did in Genesis 4? And right there and then, evil would have been eradicated and we would have had a good and happy history instead of these constant wars and those very difficult periods of time in our history. Well, I want to tell you, it would have been too easy. And the answer lies in God's sovereignty and among other things, in what He expects of us. There are many things He gives us on a silver platter, just like salvation, eternal security, and great eternal future, things we cannot acquire for ourselves, but the rest the things we can do, or at least we think we can do. He left them in our hands, and the end result is that we need the Messiah. The end result is that the Messiah had to come. In the history of man, from Genesis, man was offered all possible venues, all possible ways to prove himself, but at the end, the Bible is clear in showing us that he cannot make it without the Messiah. This is why the Messiah came very simply to save us. This is why his name is Jesus. His name is Yeshua. His name is salvation. His birth is the outcome of our failure to survive. History then stands as a witness showing that we need a Messiah. Our history is a very sad collection of failures. And these thousands of years were necessary to show how much we need him in our lives. And as it was in the history of man, so it is in our personal histories, personal lives. Many of our struggles become difficult and endless because we overlook the fact that Yeshua was already born, or that he already died on the cross. We do not need to live our lives the way it was before. The subsequent history, from the ascension to the Messiah until now, the message is the same. Today we know so much. We do so much, yet the heart of man hasn't changed. It cannot change. Only God can change it. This, I want to tell you, is behind the story of Christmas. And the portion of scriptures in front of us speaks of the month, of the very moments that preceded the coming of Jesus. It is a rich text that will, one more time, show us how different this world is from the kingdom of God. How different the values of this world are from God values that we see in the scriptures. As we're going to see the final preparations of the coming of Yeshua, it is my prayer that we will all be touched by this great event in our history, so touched as to bless also the people around us, so they may also come to a saving knowledge and see who the Jewish Messiah is. Let us now go to the text and read the final words preceding the birth. These are very significant words. They are spoken by Zacharias, who is a Jewish priest and prophet, and who here is a type of Israel. He is here doing the work Israel was called to do from the beginning, ushering the coming of the Messiah and presenting him to the nations. In many, way, in many ways, he is Israel presenting the Messiah. These are the last words before the account of the birth. See how it goes. Let's read verses 67 to 75, Luke chapter 1. It says, Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his first servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him 
without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. These words, I want to tell you, are loaded with truth and reflect the teaching of all the prophets of the Old Testament. As we have begun to see last week, Zachariah speaks of redemption, for he says he has visited us and redeemed his people in verse 68. The word redeem carried with it all the types, all the prophecies of redemption found in the Old Testament, from the sacrifices to the prophecies of the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Zacharias also mentions the house of David in verse 69 to show that finally the Messiah has come through the house of David as it was prophesied so many times. In the same verse, he calls him a horn of salvation. Who is the horn of salvation in the Old Testament? It is the Lord himself, as we see it in 2 Samuel 22.3, where David himself says, The God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. In many of these prophecies, we can see also the deity of the Messiah, because in 2 Samuel, it is God who is the horn of salvation. And here it is Yeshua who is the horn of salvation. In verse 70, Zacharias mentioned the Hebrew Scriptures prophets, and he says, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, all prophecies of the first coming find their fulfillment in Yeshua. And all of the Mosaic law as well, with all its punishment, were accomplished when Yeshua came, came into this world. In verse 72, Zacharias speaks of God's promises and his holy covenant to Israel. All of the promises given stand with the Messiah and what he did for us. Here, Zachariah brings all the Old Testament and pours it at the feet of the Messiah. And see the last line of verse 72. He says, and to remember his holy covenant. The word remember is at the root of, this, of the name Zacharias. And see the first line of verse 73. It says, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, the oath is at the root of the name of his wife, Elizabeth, both. Zachariah and Elizabeth are a type of Israel, as we have seen. Both are ushering the coming of the Messiah. So God has begun to fulfill his promise that he gave to Israel with this couple. These words of Zacharias are a conclusion of all that was said in the Hebrew Scriptures. Zacharias here represents Israel in his function and in his words in guiding us to the next chapter, to the birth. And we remember that this man was deaf, he was mute for a while, remember that? But he was miraculously healed. And now he's filled with the Spirit and speaks great words, so it will be with Israel. On whom now there's a veil, Paul says, but she will be miraculously restored, and then be that priestly nation, because this is at the root, this is at the core of the existence of the nation of Israel. When God chose them. He says in Exodus 19.5, 19.6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. A priest is one who represents God to the people. In Zacharias, for a time, for the first time in her history, Israel, through a remnant, is now doing her function. The following verses, verses 76 to 79, are very strong. There Zacharias speaks of his son, John the Baptist, who also typifies, and in a very, in a, more, in a stronger way, his people Israel. Let's read what Zachariah says about him. These are again the very last words from the, before the birth, and they are important. It says, A new child shall be called prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high has visited us, visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Have you ever wondered why John the Baptist takes so much room and importance in the gospel? Why is he mentioned in the four gospels, always preceding the Messiah and even working with the Messiah for a while? More than just spoken words, John the Baptist embodies in him all the words of the Old Testament prophets. 
He is the last Old Testament prophet that ushers the Messiah. He is not part of the church. He did not speak to the church. He is like Isaiah. He is like Hosea or Malachi as he spoke to Israel to prepare her for the coming of the Messiah. He is spoken of in verse 76 as prophet of the highest who goes before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. This is a very high position that he was given. And in this case, he outran all the preceding prophets. He is the only Jewish prophet who belonged to the group of prophets of the Old Testament that saw, that touched, that handled, and baptized the Messiah. He saw and did what all the other yearned to see and even to touch. This is why Jesus says in Luke 7, 28, For I say to you, among those born of the woman, of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, because he saw. He handled the Messiah. He was greater in extent, not in quality. And he represents the last of the Hebrew scriptures. And so the mission of, the, of John the Baptist was twofold. And it was the same as all the other prophets before him. He was to make ready the people of Israel for the coming of the Messiah. And he was to introduce the Messiah to them. This mission concludes the work of the Old Testament prophets. In him is found all the words, again, of the prophets, words that can be summed up in what he says in Matthew 3, 2, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We're going to see the importance of repentance. And being the last Old Testament prophet, he was very much, he had the very much the same function, by the way, of the first Old Testament prophet. Who was the first Old Testament prophet? Samuel. Peter tells us in Acts 3.22 that Samuel is the first of the company of prophets, the first in a way full-time prophet. What similarities are there between Samuel and John the Baptist? One major one is that Samuel introduced David and anointed him as the king of Israel, while John the Baptist introduced Yeshua, the king of kings, the descendant of David. Both find themselves at the beginning and at the end of the Davidic line. One opens the Davidic line, the other one closes it. We also read that after being anointed, David was pursued by Paul, by Saul, that is to be killed until he finally fulfilled his function of king. During this time, he was allowed to suffer tremendously. Do you know that during this time that he wrote all the messianic prophecies of Psalm 22, where it says, they shall pierce my hands and my feet, of all the other Psalms that speak of the coming of the Messiah. So it is with the Messiah that he suffered. He is Messiah, but he does not yet fulfill his mission of King Messiah yet. And he suffered so much. Like David, Yeshua will eventually be king, and not a mere king, but the king of kings. And furthermore, with both Samuel and John the Baptist, their appearances was preceded by a period of silence, silence of the word of God. And both periods were about 400 years as well. From the time of the entrance to the land with Joshua to Samuel, it is a period of 400 years of silence from God. A difficult one that we read especially with the history in the book of Judges. And so it is between Malachi, the last testament prophet, to John the Baptist, difficult time. We can see it in the history of Hanukkah. So John and Samuel shared very much the same function, but it was very much more intense for John the Baptist. As we go deeper into the Gospel of Luke, more truth concerning this man will surface because he takes an important place in the Gospel because he represents Israel. Let's now go back to the words of Zacharias. His very last words are very powerful. And they speak of the condition of man then and now. See how the Messiah is spoken of in verse 78 first. As the sunrise, as the day spring. This word in the Greek means rising. It is used of the word east, where the sun rises. It has reference of an Old Testament prophecy in Malachi 4.2, but it says, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, Yeshua Mashiach, shall arise with healing in his wings. In this sense, Yeshua is our sunrise, our healer, our comfort. He is the one who lightens our path and who provides all for us. But these words, I want to tell you in verse 78, 
are really given in relation to those words that come after. To give light to those who what, sit where? In darkness. Again, and in the shadow of what? Of death. Let's pause for a moment and see what really these words imply. Here what is clear is that the Bible divides the whole world into two. First, those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, and the others who are under the sunrise. Do you see the difference? But do you see our world in the same way as the Bible sees our world? That's the question. Do we realize that there are two camps, two types of people, those who are with God and those who are without God? Are we living our lives with the knowledge that the majority of people around us sit in darkness and in the shadow of death? Or have we become hardened and insensitive to it? Or maybe we just cannot believe it. Because as some would say, my neighbor is so nice that I think he will be saved at the end. Or maybe because as some would say, God is so gracious that he's going to do something, he's going to save everyone at the end. That's simply not the biblical teaching. You will not find this in the, in the Bible. The scriptures clearly says that the majority of our neighbors are sitting in darkness in the shadow of death. And this is why we have Christmas. This is why the Messiah was born, to save them out of it. Have you read of the story about Charlie Peace? You know, this man was a notorious English burglar and murderer from the late 1800s whose somewhat remarkable life later inspired dozens of novels and films. Peace is mentioned by name in one of Sherlock Holmes and Mark Twain's novels. And Leonard Ravenhill, in his book, Why Revival Tarries, recounts the last moment of Charlie Peace's life. On the day he was being taken to his execution, listen to a minister reading from the Bible, and when he found out that he was reading about heaven and hell, he looked at the preacher and he said, Sir, if I believed what you and the word of God says, and even if England was covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it on hands and knees and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from an eternal hell like this. Somehow this criminal understood the message of the scriptures and it astonished him to see that not much was done for this cause. If we believed it to be true, somehow he understood what many of us have forgotten. And he wondered why we are so lax. Remember the words of Jesus, of Yeshua to Paul on the road to Damascus? When he called them, what did he say to him? It is the same mission he gives to all who come to him in Acts 26, 18. There the word of Paul, to Paul, he says, he says, go and open their eyes in order to turn them from what? Darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is what your Savior say, is saying. See how the division is so crude, so clear? We have here darkness and Satan, and we have light and God. There's no middle point, by the way. This is how the Bible presents this world. And if you know the truth, the Bible squarely puts the responsibility on us all. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher. Let me paraphrase this for you. How shall they hear without you proclaiming the truth about the Messiah? This is what it says. There are many ways to proclaim the Messiah. And one of the most efficient ways is through our changed lives. Remember, our changed life and through the Word of God. The two must go together. And man, especially today, needs to know this because now man thinks that he's heading to glory. He thinks that humankind will establish heaven on earth. That is where the Bible says the complete opposite. This is where we come in to tell them about Christmas, about what Jesus did. You know, several years ago, the, a book was published. It was entitled Looking Out for Number One. Maybe you read this book. 
You know, it was a number one bestseller. The description of this book goes like this. It says, in page after page of this self-confidence, self-enhancing Bible, this number one bestseller will clearly demonstrate how to get from where you are now to where you want to be. And on the dedication page, the author, Ringer, he wrote, dedicated to the hope that somewhere in the universe there exists a civilization where the inhabitants possess sole dominion over their own lives. Actually, there's a place like this. It's called hell. Where is God in there? Where is God in the world? People want to do away from God. They want to put God completely on the side. Man does not want to be in submission to God. This is the story of the Tower of Babel again and again, always looking for ways to evade God. So what are we going to do about our neighbors? Begin to pray for them. Pray by name, pray by address, pray without ceasing. Prayer has always been at the thresholds of miracles. We sometimes think God superficially forgives everyone just because He is God. Even in our own personal lives, many believers say, I know my choice is against the teaching of the Scriptures, but I'm so unhappy. I know God doesn't want me to be unhappy. I'm going to do it anyway and trust Him for, to forgive. It doesn't work like this. May I remind you that genuine forgiveness cost Yeshua His life on the cross. It's not for nothing. Get alone with God today and ask Him, is there something in my life, Lord, that I need to repent of? Is there something in my life that stops you from coming to me so I can be a light also unto the world? You know, on a historical side or theological side, there's something very new in verse 79. I don't know if you noticed. Look at it again. It says, to shine upon them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guard our feet into the way of peace. Notice that there are two groups of people here, right? The them and the are. Who are they? This is also quite a revelation here. Here the them are the nations of the world and the are is Israel. Until this time, Israel had kept the truth about God to itself because it was never fit enough to be a light unto the nations. The law did not change them. The words of the prophet did not change them. But now the Messiah, the perfect Israel, comes and redeems the whole world, including the nation of Israel, so to give way to the new nation of Israel who will be composed of the remnant of Israel. This new nation was composed of all Jewish believers of the time, including the apostles. And after the resurrection, the Gentiles joined in to form the body of the Messiah, the church. This, I want to tell you, was, both, was not known to the people of Israel before. That both the remnant of the nation and the remnant of Israel will compose one body, as is spoken of in Ephesians 3, and be the body of the Messiah and speak the word of God to the others. The last words of this section speaks of the growth of John the Baptist. Look at verse 80. It says, So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Notice the word desert or wilderness, it's actually in plural. It was not one wilderness, but in many deserted places. This perhaps indicates to us the many struggles John went through during his younger years. For the Greek word for wilderness really means abandonment. It means isolation. It means forsaken. We do not know much about the life of John the Baptist before his ministry. What we know is that his parents were quite old, so maybe he became an orphan at, an, at a young age. That must have been a wilderness to face. And the fact of being led by the Spirit will also single them out from the others. That is another wilderness for him. And we know that the life of a prophet was not an easy one since the person was going against the grain of the majority just like we've seen last week. This is why all the prophets of God were killed. By whom? By the religious authorities of the time and the civil authorities of the time. And this loneliness followed him, even when he was surrounded by crowds of people. Remember the prophecy of Isaiah 40 that speaks of him? It says, he will be the voice crying in the wilderness. The wilderness is Israel. It is the mass of the people, a place of spiritual wilderness where 
as God said, there was a famine of his word. Do you remember Amos 8.11? It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but worse, of hearing the word of God. This is what they need. This is what the world needs to hear, the word of God. And John the Baptist was called to feed the remnant as a voice in the wilderness of this world, like all the other prophets and like you. Let's now begin to see the very moment before the birth of our great Messiah. Let's just read the first three verses of Luke chapter 2. It says, And he came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. You know, I love how the account of the birth of the Messiah begins. Here we are brought into the scene and placed in Israel to see how the things were. And the first people mentioned are Caesar Augustus and Quirinius. Two very powerful and proud men. One thought that he was a god, and the other was really a supreme leader in Israel. But here they are mentioned only because God used them to set the stage so that his son might come to be born. As Daniel the prophet said to the leader of the first world power, Nebuchadnezzar, who is of the same kind as these two men. In Daniel 2.21, he spoke about God and said, and he changes the times and seasons, and he removes kings and raises up king. Augustine and Quirinius may have had no idea that they were where they were and doing what they were doing because God was in control. And his son, and because his son was about to be born. These men disappeared completely. But the event surrounding the birth of the Messiah does not stop to amaze us. And it is in verse 2 where the Bible has been severely attacked and where Luke is believed to have mistaken. Because in history, Quirinius became legate of Syria in 15 AD, but the birth of the Messiah took place way before this time. So they say the Bible is wrong. Now let me ask you something. Would you change a dollar for a 25 cents? You know, I love history, I love Roman history, but then again, if you are going to use Roman history to get a clear view of what happened, you're in for a ride. Well, it's an interesting history. You will, for instance, first realize that it is a mess. Many times the functions of many leaders would overlap, and the Senate of Rome would elect leaders and give them a new title, but this leader would never exercise this function. For instance, Tacitus, the historian, tells us that at this time a man called Alius Slamia was elected president of Syria, but he never laid foot there. And who was doing the work in Syria under whom Israel was? We can see that various scratches procurator of Judah at the time of 1526 AD had powers that exceeded that mere procurator. His function was similar to those of legate of Syria, so he was actually legate of Syria, but who was the procurator of Judah at this time? The function was fulfilled by Pontius Pilate. Am I confusing you? That's the very point. That is the very point. This is Roman history. Would you change a dollar for a 25 cents? Would you change what Luke says in chapter 1, verse 3, that he had the perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account because of the Spirit of God was with him. Would you change the inspired writings for a mess? History is constantly adjusting itself. This is why it's interesting, by the way. But the Bible, its truth are frozen in time. This is why I'm opting for Luke more than the whims of the Senate of Rome. You know, these attacks on the Bible reminds me of the story of the lost key. It's called, I think, also the Eddington story. You know, someone was once looking for his car keys in a parking lot, and a passerby noticed that he was looking only in one place, going around and around the lamppost. So he came to him and he asked him why he was going around this pole nonstop. He told them that he lost his keys. So the other person asked him, but why you look only here, going around and around? The other said, he says, because here I can see. You see? And 
What about the rest of the parking lot? They cannot see. They cannot see. It is this type of individual that judge our Bible. They judge it as if they had all knowledge. And they do not know nor believe that this is the book of God. And that there are things in there we cannot see anywhere else. And so the census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Now concerning the census, Roman census ran in 14 years cycle, by the way. That, this is serious, by the way. And they took years to finish. They were always counting people. And we read of a second census, by the way, in Acts 5.37. Of this census, Josephus, the Jewish historians of the day, and who was very precise in his dates, tell us that this census took place in 6 to 7 AD. Now, if you take off 14 years, we are back to about 7, 8 BC. This is the, the time we think that the Messiah was born. We have already seen that 7 BC was the approximate date of his birth. This is another confirmation of it. And so it says that there was a census at this time, and the purpose of the census was really so that Joseph and Mary would go to Bethlehem to be registered because they were from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David. And Mary was carrying the Messiah, who according to the prophecy, he was to be born in Bethlehem. Look at Luke 2, 4. It says, Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth into Judea. To the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. This is according to the prophecy of Micah. Micah 5.2. It says, But you, Bethlehem Ephratat, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from everlasting. It's in Bethlehem that is to be born. How come today you have... Some religious sects that believe that their leader is a messiah. Was he born in Bethlehem? No. He was born somewhere in Russia. We call it Bethlehem, they say. Right? You know, and see how the messiah is described here. Who's going forth from of old, from everlasting. His origins are from eternity. Not like you and not like me. No other man has his origins in past eternity. This tells us that he came into the body of a man to fulfill his mission. This is what the rest of the account of Luke is about actually to relate to us. Because the Messiah was born, the world was adjusted for this grand event. And the following verse in Luke 2, 6 to 7, speak of his birth. Let's begin reading just 6 and 7. We'll read the rest soon. It says, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her first son. Hallelujah. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. How sad, right? Here is the great contrast. The one to be ruler in Israel who's going forth from of old, from everlasting. There was no room for him in Israel. There was no room for him. This is why he was born in a manger. He was not born in a king's palace, but in a manger. And he was going to be frail. He was going to be weak. He was to come as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Very vulnerable. This is the most amazing thing here. That these two things actually were to represent the sign to the shepherd later in the text. But the manger... We can see his rejection. And by the swaddling clothes, we can see his humility. Let's read the rest, verses 8 to 14. Here there is something unusual that is reported to us. And in line, of course, with the rest. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all nations. And there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is called Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in a swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, 
and on the earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Even heaven was waiting for this great moment when Yeshua came to be born. This is the first public announcement of the birth of the Messiah. And it was given to whom? Shepherds. Why shepherds? Why did God go to shepherds? Here we are going to find a great truth here. First, see where the shepherds were located. We're going to see that they were located right in between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. In verse 8, we're told that the shepherds were in the same region that is not too far from Bethlehem. Verse 15 confirms it by telling us that they were not too far from the small town. But however, there is a passage in the Mishnah that is the oral law of the Jewish people that tell us that the flocks which pastured outside of Bethlehem were kept actually for temple sacrifices. This is what the Mishnah says in the book of Sukkah. It says, cattle found between Jerusalem and Migdal Eder and in an equivalent range of all the sides of the city, male if they are deemed to be burnt offerings, female if they are deemed to be peace offerings. Rabbi Judah said, that which is suitable for Passover offerings are Passover offerings, and they are found 30 days before the festivals. Mishnah, the book of Sukkah. It is significant that the shepherds who were tending the flocks, the animal for sacrifices for the temple, would be the first to hear of the final sacrifice which is actually Yeshua himself. But there is much more. Notice in the Mishnah speaks of Migdal Eder, right? This place we find mentioned in Genesis 35, 21. And it is there that Rachel, by the way, gave birth to Benjamin, after which she died and she was buried there. This was a tower from which the shepherds watch their flock. Migdal means tower, Eder means flock itself. And as we read in Luke 2, 8, it might be the same place. They were keeping watch over the flock by night. Perhaps it was there that the angel met the shepherds. And from there, they went to Bethlehem to see the sun. And that Benjamin was, was born there has much significance. Benjamin, who actually has two names into which we can see the two comings, the two ministry of the Messiah. His first name, what was it? As Rachel lay down dying, she says, this is the son of my sorrow. But Jacob came and he says, no, this is the son of my right hand. Son of my soul reminds us of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And the life of the Messiah in his first coming when he fulfilled his role of prophet. Son of my right hand. Reminds us as when he's going to come, actually, as king of kings. He reminds us also of his actual work as priests, as we read in Acts 5.31. These two functions were the fruits of his birth that began in Bethlehem where he was born. See that the Messiah of Israel, we also see, we also need, that is, to walk from Migdal Eder to Bethlehem in order to see him, in order to recognize him. And there's also something about these shepherds. Somehow the religious leaders of the time did not like them at all. Why? They were considered... The shepherds were considered to be religious outcasts, and their testimony was not admissible in court. In the Mishnah, they put them at par with, and I quote, they said, the shepherds, the thugs, the robbers, and anyone with a shady reputation in financial matters. Why were they against the shepherds? We don't know, right? But we're, we're not told why, but it is possible that because of their demanding work, they could not keep the Pharisaic laws and regulation. They needed to be working on the Shabbat. In fact, this is why they rejected Yeshua. They thought that he was going against their own Shabbat. So they were outcast. A shepherd was forbidden on the assumption that it would be, he would have stolen property. That is, if you go buy something for him, it was forbidden to buy anything from him. And furthermore, there's something else, and I want to bring this up because this is very important. They had, the Mishnah had a particular dislike of priestly shepherds. Why? We don't know. It's written in their Mishnah, they are actually priestly shepherds are not to be believed. This is what they say. Priestly shepherds, this is what the shepherds in Luke 2 were. 
This is what they must have been since they were guarding the animals for the sacrifices. They were not guarding the animals for the people. They were the priestly shepherds keeping the animals for that. They were not to be believed. Why? Is it because afterwards they went all around in verse 20 and preached the word of God to all Israel about the, the birth of the Messiah? This is again another indication that the Messiah will be rejected and despised by the majority. You know, God could not go to any of the religious groups, right? He went to the shepherds. You had a number of them in Israel. You had the Essenes, you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and different groupings, the priests, the Levites, the scribes. None could be elected to receive the news. Let me ask you a question now. If the birth of the Messiah was to occur today, which group would he choose to manifest himself? Who would represent the shepherds of the first century? Hard to tell, right? Would he go to the Baptists or to the Charismatics? Maybe he will go to the Lubavitch or the Satmir. Or would he go to the Catholics or the Presbyterian? Which one do you think? I think we can figure it out. It is by now quite clear where he would go. Gathering all the information we have in the scriptures, gathering all the characteristics of our God, God will reveal his birth, the birth of his son, to the one who has a broken spirit. This is what it says. A broken and a contrite heart. Who said this? David himself. He already knew and other men of God understood this. It's in Isaiah 57, 15. It says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and, high and holy place and with him who has a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Where does God live? He lives in heaven. Very high up, high, high up that is. But he also lives with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. That is beautiful. I want to tell you what we're saying here. A contrite and humble spirit that is the mark of a man and woman in the scriptures. This is where the Messiah, this is what the Messiah is looking for. The word contrite in the Hebrew comes from the root meaning to be crushed, to be broken by sin. As the person who discovers the sins, not only in his life, but in the world. So he is crushed and he goes to God. The word humble comes from the root meaning to be low, to sing, to say, yes, Lord, I can't make it of myself, by myself. Both these words speak of the one who comes to God for healing. Our first approach to God should be one of humility and of repentance because it is at this point that one is face to face with the holiness of God. And notice the name of God, how God names himself here, right? His name is holy. He says, I'm the holy God. Both of these words also speak of those who mourn for sin for their own and also for those around. It is with those that God dwells. They are the mark of of truly repentant heart. And so it must have been this, so must have been that is these shepherds. To them, God came first. He disregarded the religious institution. He disregarded ev everything else. And he went to these people because he knew their heart, even though they were outcast in the society. And where can you really find the Messiah? Really, this is a matter between you and the Lord. You and the word of God. You know, we can know God in nature. We can see that nature speaks of him. This is why you have so many religions. But how does he manifest himself? How would you know the character of God? Through his word. Through his word. I want to tell you a story. This is a true story. I want to conclude with this. The story is about Stan Telchin, a successful Jewish businessman. He felt betrayed when his daughter, 21-year-old Judy, called from college and said, you know that I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. To prove his daughter wrong, Talchin began an energetic quest for truth. So this did his wife, Ethel, and their other daughter, Anne. When they searched, 
It recreated a friction between Stan and Ethel, so they agreed to pursue their studies independently. Months later, Stan accepted an invitation to attend the national convocation of Messianic Jews. He planned to work the convention just like any other business, meeting with anyone who thought could help him. After a series of meetings, Stan lay awake in his dorm room, realizing he had arrived at a point of crisis. If the Bible was true and he had concluded that it was, then he really did believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He also admitted that he believed in the Bible as God's inspired word, but he could not quite say that Jesus is the Messiah. He asks his roommate to pray for him, praying simply, God, give Stan your peace and resolve his inner conflict. The next morning at breakfast, a man at Stan's table asked him to pray for the meals. Started by the request, Stan bowed his head and said, Praise be the Lord, our Lord, our God, King of the universe. I thank you for the fellowship and the friendship of this table. I thank you for what we have learned at this meeting, and I ask you now to bless this food, and I do, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, he says. For a moment, he sat there amazed of what he had just prayed, the faces of others at the table were suddenly jubilant. Stan said to one of them, you're a believer. One by one, they got up from their seats and hugged Stan. Several cried with joy. Stan began to weep too. He wasn't sure how his wife actually will take the news. But he called her and he said, Ethel, honey, it's me and it's over. I've made my decision. Jesus is the Messiah. So there was a pause. And on the other line, as Stan held his breath, then his wife said softly, thank God, that makes it unanimous. We're all waiting for you. You know, Stan's entire family, and by the way, the book is on sale. Uh, even in Amazon, it's called Betrayed. You know, Stan's entire family, his wife and, his, and both his daughters, had decided to trust Yeshua as the Messiah. Each had been praying and waiting patiently for the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, this man went to search the scriptures and he found that Jesus was the Messiah. Because if you stay within the confines of the Old Testament, you cannot but see that Jesus is the Messiah. Otherwise, you're going to have to go out and make your own religion and your own Talmud and your own Mishnah. But if you stay within the scriptures, Yeshua then is the Messiah. Let's bow our head in prayer. Heavenly Father, there is one thing that we have learned today. It is this great love you have for us in sending your Son. What a great future awaits those who have recognized Jesus, Yeshua, as their personal Savior and realize the great sacrifice you made so that we may join the family of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for being with us and in us. Thank you for creating that new nature in us. We are your children, and one thing that encourages us more than anything else is knowing that you are God, that you are with us. And so, Lord, I ask that you help anyone here today who is discouraged. If some here are going through difficult times, would you, Lord, encourage them today? If some here are looking at the circumstances and feeling overwhelmed, would you help them? and encourage them. In some, if some are physically sick, Lord, would you heal them? And if someone does not know you, Lord, would you save that person, Lord? As we pray in the name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. May the Lord bless you.